There we go. Back to yep. share screen. All yeah. right. So yeah. those and of us. Just yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, if you're you, if you're checking on this late and viewing this later down the road, you're just getting started. That's all right. We're talking about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so the reason why biopsy is so important in these is one, you got to figure out a diagnosis, right? But you really need to grade these things because the most common being a well differentiated grade one neuroendocrine tumor is a it's it's a rather indolent disease. Actually, they can still metastasize and they can still spread. Um, but it's very different from sort of its its more um, high grade, poorly differentiated um, uh, on the other end of the spectrum. Okay, and so as I mentioned with that EUS, they do get sort of cores or you know mini core biopsies, right? So this is not cytology necessarily they're getting; they are getting architecture, and as you can kind of relate that to thyroid, how important that is. Um, we can get a sort of a differentiation on it. So we determine differentiation um, based on visual and then on two uh, molecular markers, essentially, or, or pathologic studies is KI-67 and the mitotic count. So the vast majority, and, and so every, it's either well differentiated or poorly differentiated, okay? So well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors can still be high grade. They can still be a grade three in which they have a high KI-67 and they have an elevated mitotic count. However, as long as they're in that well differentiated category, that's that's still more favorable than what we call the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, right? So the other ones we call neuroendocrine tumors or carcinoids. Um, once we get to the poorly differentiated grade threes, you start hearing the term neuroendocrine carcinoma, um, and certainly you can get sort of a mixed neuroendocrine, non neuroendocrine. So we can get some sometimes these sort of mixed adeno um, with neuroendocrine features, neuroendocrine features with adeno features. It can get a little bit confusing. So why this is critical, the first thing I have to sort of explain to patients and reassure them is that when they have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, it is not pancreas cancer in the way that they think of pancreas cancer, right? This is not pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Pancreatic adenocarcinoma is a completely different disease with much different survival and much different treatment options. So that's kind of the first thing you have to tell them and explain to them is, yes, you have cancer of the pancreas, but you don't have pancreas cancer like like your friends and colleagues are going to think that you have when you tell me you have pancreas cancer, right? It's not the thing that Alex Trebek died of, right? Um, and because look at the survival here. So, right, so pancreas is sort of sitting right here in the middle. And so that grade one that we talked about, the median overall survival um, of, of is 10 years, 12 years, okay? And that's what you have to reassure them is that this this becomes a chronic disease that we manage long term. Even for the higher grade, the grade twos, the, the median overall survival is on the order of five years. However, the grade threes and fours, those more aggressive tumors, survival is lower. And you can see this pattern for all the sites that you see here, appendix, cecum, colon, lung, et cetera. The pattern of very favorable prognosis with grade one and worsening prognosis as grade increases. Now, sometimes, this is from metastatic tumors, and we'll, get, we'll circle back to pancreatic, but sometimes we're trying to figure out where these things come from, right? So we'll have a liver tumor um, that will biopsy, and it's metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, and we're trying to figure out where it comes from, right? Well, the pathologists are smart enough to figure this out, and basically they can do a series of stains to kind of give us a better idea of where this is coming from. So um, CDX2 positive is going to point us to the midgut, TTF1 is going to point us to the lung. Um, for the pancreas, where we see PR or the PPAX8 um, positive and then SATB2 negative is going to often be the pattern for pancreas, okay? So um, I don't have these memorized. I sort of rely on working with the pathologist to try to figure out if we have metastatic lesions where this is coming from. Because so the thing with pancreas or in any neuroendocrine tumors, the primary can actually be very small and you can have a bunch of metastatic disease. And so we see this a lot in the small bowel, the midgut, sort of the ileal carcinoids or the appendiceal carcinoids. We'll have a liver full of tumor. Um, and, and the primary will be a six, eight millimeter primary tumor in the terminal ileum. And so um, it can actually be kind of hard to figure out where these things come from sometimes. Okay, so we, get a, we did an EUS, we get a biopsy. Um, 
we need to now sort of blood and tumor markers, basically, right? So in general, for all pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, I always get a chromogranin A and then test urine 5-HIAA, okay? Um, these are pretty much recommended both for functional and non-functional. Now, the, um, the residents and fellows will ask me sometimes, do we sort of get a whole panel? Like, is it like an adrenal, like where we just kind of check everything? And the answer is no. Is if they're not exhibiting specific symptoms that we would expect them to be functional, you don't necessarily have to do a whole panel of hormone studies, including gastrin, glucagon, insulin, proinsulin, poly, uh, pancreatic polypeptide, et cetera. So these we do sort of as clinically indicated as the recommendations suggest. Um, but again, most everybody gets chromogranin A and 5-HIAA. And we can use those. Um, I'll sh you know, the next slide we'll see that the, both the, the levels of chromogranin A and the urinary 5-HIA will correlate with tumor burden. Okay, so there is a correlation. The top line there are the number of lesions, so the number of, of metastatic uh, liver lesions um, and their chromogranin A levels. The bottom panel shows the difference between people who have liver mets and do not have liver mets. The people with liver metastases were much more likely to have elevated chromogranin A and 5 hiaa So these are valuable tumor markers. We can use them to um, assess response for people with metastatic disease when we're giving them systemic treatment. We can use them for monitoring patients after operative resection to look for recurrence or to heighten our suspicion for recurrence. The caveats, of course, with randomly measuring chromogranin A can be elevated with other things as well, so you have to take that into account. But you typically don't get into the thousands unless there's actually a tumor involved. So imaging. So I talked about EUS, and EUS really is more for sort of image-guided biopsy. And EUS for pancreatic tumors is less helpful for, like, staging, like, to figure out resectability. What we need there is a three-phase CT scan or an MRI. A three-phase uh, CT scan means a non-contrasted scan, and then an arterial and a portal venous phase. Um, and this is to do two things. One, for pancreatic tumors, it's to determine resectability. We want to localize the tumor, see where it is in the pancreas. We want to see its relationship um, to the blood vessels, to the artery, and to the vein. But we're also looking for liver metastases, okay? And that's the other thing that's really important. That's the most common site to have metastatic disease, both at the time of diagnosis or recurrence after surgery. And so what I'll show you here is basically the arterial enhancement that we can see. This is an arterial phase of a CT scan with a liver metastasis. This is a patient I'm seeing in the hospital right now, actually. Um, who has this enhancing, you can see in the venous phase it's hypodense, but then in the arterial phase it enhances. There are not a lot of tumors that will arterially enhance in the pancreas. But when I see an, a, a contrast enhancing tumor in the pancreas, it's a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in, in, um, until proven otherwise, except if they have a history of renal cell carcinoma. Renal cell carcinomas can metastasize to the pancreas and have a very similar contrast enhancing appearance. Um, and then weird things like intrapancreatic accessory spleens. You can get splenules basically in the pancreas that will be enhancing as well. Again, drawing the distinction between adenocarcinomas, pancreatic adenocarcinomas are hypo-enhancing, hypodense masses in the pancreas. So they look the exact opposite. I've got a couple other pictures of some enhancing nodules in the pancreas later on. So what about um, nuclear medicine studies, all right? So the old Octrea scan or octreotide scan is really no longer used, right? And that's a good thing. So I don't know, maybe some of the um, younger trainees might not realize I got a treatise scan was like a three-day study. Like it was, it was a pain. Nobody liked it, right? And it was not very sensitive, actually. It wasn't really that effective. And so now we have what's called dotatate PET scan, okay? This functions um, exactly or very similarly to the regular uh, FDG glucose PET scan that we use for other sort of general malignancies. Um, however, it's, um, it's gallium linked to dotatate, so it, it, it goes to the octreotide receptors, basically. It has better sensitivity and specificity, so it's 95% sensitive and detecting um, neuroendocrine metastases versus only 31% versus octreotide. And again, visually, it looks just like a PET scan, okay? So we don't have to really change how we sort of think or look about things. This is a um, patient here with multiple liver metastases, and actually what they ended up finding was the primary here, which is a, which is a tumor in the tail or in the body of the pancreas. So um, 
We don't order these for everybody. Um, if they have a small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor under two centimeters, I don't routinely get a dotatate PET unless there's some suspiciously enlarged lymph nodes. Um, the sensitivity for these is similar to sensitivity for, for PET scans in that it probably has to be close to a centimeter in size for it to light up reliably. Those small sort of sub-centimeter lymph nodes or lung nodules, it may not be that helpful. Okay, so what are we going to do? So what are we going to do for our guy here, right? So um, he has a 2.2 centi centimeter mass. I did get a dotatate PET on him, and we'll talk about that 2 centimeter magical cutoff here. Um, and then we did do an EUS biopsy as well, differentiated grade one neuroendocrine tumor. Um, the interesting question about him is, so in this particular case, really the treatment for this gentleman actually kind of hinges on his metastatic prostate cancer, right? And, and he's actually responding well to treatment, actually. Um, um, he, he's responding um, to androgen deprivation. His PSA is almost undetectable. So we are probably going to operate on him and remove this tumor because, um, quite frankly, he's doing well from his uh, prostate cancer standpoint and that this pancreatic cancer, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor does have a risk of developing metastases. So when we're deciding what to do with local regional treatment, the first thing we have to decide is whether it's functional or not. And again, we'll do that basically based on history, okay? So if it's functional, we pretty much always recommend resection, all right? I have a plus or minus hereditary. We'll talk about MEN1. Um, it can get a little tricky to decide when to operate on those folks. But in general, functional neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas should be removed. And for two reasons, we'll talk about when we'll, we'll kind of go into a little bit of, of why that is. So if they're non-functional, now we worry about size, okay? Size is critically important, the cutoff being two centimeters, okay? If it's greater than two centimeters, we in general recommend resection. If they're less than two centimeters, then we simply um, recommend observation. The exception to that being only if they don't have clinical evidence of, of enlarged lymph node metastases, right? So I, you, you can get a one, one and a half centimeter pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that has enlarged lymph nodes. You can do dotatate PET, they light up, they have lymph node metastases. That patient needs an operation. And, and because the reason we have this two centimeter cutoff is we're actually trying to predict who's going to have positive lymph nodes, who's going to have micrometastatic lymph nodes. So that's the rationale. So somebody who has enlarged lymph nodes already and you know they have lymph node metastases, well, then that person needs an operation. You don't really worry about the size of their tumor. It's the person who has clinically absent or clinically normal lymph nodes, no evidence of metastatic disease, that you're trying to decide what's the risk of them having radiographically occult micrometastatic disease in their lymph nodes. We have some data to guide us, right? So if you use a cutoff of um, 10 millimeters, um, anything greater than 10 millimeters, about 16% will have uh, lymph node metastases. These are non-gastronomas, importantly, so these are sort of non-functioning non-gastronomas in this particular study. If you go up to about 15 to 20 millimeters, you start getting into about a 24 to 30 percent risk of developing lymph node metastases, and we've sort of collectively decided that's high enough that we would recommend um, resection at that point. So here's a great study out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and in the 90s and 2000s, they were just taking all these things out. So they were operating, this is a study in which they evaluated non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas less than three centimeters in size. And you can see that they, you know, in the early period in the 90s, they resected 94% of these. Um, and really, even into the late 2000s, early 2010s, they were resecting about 70% of these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors less than three centimeters. So they reported their results. And, and what they basically found is that resection was not associated with any difference in overall survival. That's in the top left there. And, and it sort of was not really associated at all with metastasis-free survival. Actually, in the curve, the observation group had prolonged metastasis-free survival compared to the resection group. There's probably some selection bias here, probably some of those resection patients probably had some clinical evidence of enlarged lymph nodes. They had a reason for them to operate on. Um, so I don't don't mean to suggest that resecting them is bad, but it's just this, this paper is a really important paper that shows us that the outcomes are really good if you just observe them. In you know, the five-year overall survival is on the order of 90 to 99, 91 to 99% in both groups, and on the order of 99 to 88% metastasis-free survival in both groups. 
So this is an interesting question. So if you decide to watch them, do they grow, right? So do we say, all right, like a one and a half centimeter, we're going to watch it. What's the kind of incidence or rate at which they'll become a two centimeter thing when now all of a sudden we say we got a lot of resected, right? It's the weirdest thing in the world. These things, once you start looking at them, they don't grow. It's like Schrodinger's cat. Like once you observe it, it is what it is and it doesn't change. This doesn't make any sense to me because a four centimeter pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor at some point must have been a 1.5 centimeter pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. But really, once we identify these things, we don't see growth rates. You can see here, most of these patients were followed for three to five years, and they basically, they rarely grow. This is a second study, exactly the same findings. These sub-two centimeter neuroendocrine tumors, very rarely do they ever grow. And here, none of them grew such that they grew across that two centimeter threshold where we would recommend observation or recommend operation. And again, they do very well. So observation versus surgical resection in patients with less than two centimeter neuroendocrine tumors. Um, there's no difference in overall survival. So again, if this gentleman, you know, again, so 2.2, you know, he reaches the cutoff, right? We should probably resect him. If he was 1.5 centimeters, I would watch him, no problem at all. So operation. Um, so you can resect these. Once you decide to resect them, how are you going to resect them? Uh, you can basically do it any way you want, being like an open or a minimally invasive approach. Um, I would say no enucleation. There's basically only one sort of scenario when we do an enucleation, which is simply, and sounds exactly, exactly what it sounds like, you enucleate or you just basically cut out the nodule out of the pancreas, leaving the remnant pancreas tissue behind. These things are really well circumscribed. They're very... We'll show some ultrasound pictures and some operative pictures. They're, they're really easy to find. They're really easy to see. They're very distinct from the pancreatic parenchyma. Um, however, it never makes sense to me, except in the case of insulinoma. So insulinomas are the only thing that you enucleate, and that's because they have a very low risk of having metastatic disease or lymph node metastases. So some would advocate if you have a less than 2-centimeter tumor, you can enucleate them because the risk of lymph node metastases is low. I would counter is why are you operating on that person to begin with? Because their risk of developing metastases anyways is very low. So not only do you not really need to worry about the lymph nodes, you don't need to worry about that tumor, right? And so nucleation, um, to me, only really plays a role in insulinomas. And I say you want to get the lymph nodes. However, there are some evidence that, like, the more lymph nodes you get doesn't necessarily matter, and this is a staging phenomenon, right? Like, basically, you want to be able to sample the lymph nodes, so that's why you do sort of a formal resection to get the lymph nodes around the pancreas with you, but you don't have to do an extended lymphadenectomy. All you're probably doing is, is staging them better, right? So this is a paper from SEER data. The red line there is N0 disease, so known... Um, clinically node negative or known pathologically node negative patients. The green line are node positive, so there definitely is a difference in recurrence and survival if you have positive lymph nodes, okay? I'm not uh, advocating for that. What I'm saying is that it, I don't know that removing them is actually therapeutic or actually does anything, right? Because the NX, this is the blue line, these would be people who had no lymph node sampled, so these, were, these must have been like enucleations. You see there their survival is basically no different than the other one. It's actually the same as the N0, right? And here they, they used a cutoff of 10 nodes, and they said, all right, was there any benefit to, if you had greater than 10 nodes harvested versus less than 10 nodes? And basically they, they found no difference in survival, um, whether you had extended lymphadenectomy or sort of a limited lymphadenectomy. Now, these are SEER data. It's hard to tease this out. You don't really know a lot about the operative um, details or intent, but you don't have to go crazy getting lymph nodes. But you should sample the lymph nodes because we know it does have prognostic significance. Okay. So we've decided we're going to resection, resect this. There's basically only two pancreas operations. Um, and it basically de it depends on where this thing is located. If the tumor is located in the head or uncinate here, then they need a Whipple operation. This red line is sort of uh, meant to be right about where that portal vein and SMV go underneath the pancreas. And the, the idea being is that if it's in the head or uncinate, you can't really remove this area without getting into the pancreatic duct or bile duct here. So you have to do a Whipple operation to remove all of this. Anything to the screen right, patient's left of this line, in what we call the body and tail of the pancreas, you can do a distal pancreatectomy with or without splenectomy. Okay? Okay, so what's a Whipple operation? So Whipple operation is removing the head of the pancreas. 
is intimately associated with the first part of the with the duodenum, with the gall, with the bile duct, um, and with the obviously the pancreatic duct and the distal part of the stomach. So all of that needs to go. And so this is um, this is not probably really I, this paper is actually from a ductal adenocarcinoma, which is usually has bigger tumors and things like that. But this is the view. This is the idea. We divide it right along here along the SMV portal vein. Everything to the patient's right gets resected and the remaining tail stays in place. And this is an operative picture of what you're left with. So the PV right there, that's the portal vein. This is the SMV. This looks like it had a little uh, uh, venous reconstruction here. You have to cut the bile duct to do this. So the little CBD there in green is the common bile duct. That little purple stitch is on the pancreatic duct. This is the pancreatic, this is the remnant pancreas here. Um, and that's probably the uh, hepatic artery being retracted out of the way. So once you do this operation, you then have to reconstruct everything. So you have to perform an anastomosis to the remnant pancreas so that the pancreatic juices are drained. You have to perform an anastomosis to the bile duct so that the bile is drained. And then you have to perform an anastomosis to the stomach so that they can eat regularly. All those anastomoses have problems. This is particularly a problem for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So the problem with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in Whipple's are that the pancreas is usually very normal. So for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas, they usually have a component of pancreatitis or inflammation. They've had ductal obstruction, so they have a dilated pancreatic duct. They have a dilated bile duct. You can see it. It's firm, hard tissue. It's easy to sew to and make these anastomoses. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are the exact opposite. Okay? Again, these are relatively indolent, slow-growing slow -growing tumors. You can have a two or three centimeter tumor in the head of the pancreas and have no ductal obstruction, which means you're sewing to a one to two millimeter size pancreatic duct and a pancreas that's soft. It's like trying to throw stitches in a stick of butter that's been sitting outside in the summer. All right, this is a really hard thing to do. The complication that you get from a Whipple procedure is leak at that pancreatic ojejunostomy, um, and that's a, that's a potentially very bad complication. So the rate of leak from a Whipple in patients for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is much, much higher than those for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Another reason why, if we can watch these patients, we will, because this operation is harder on them than in, than in the uh, traditional adenocarcinoma patients. All right, so there's two operations, right? That's the Whipple operation. So if it's to the other side of the, of the neck of the pancreas, uh, you can do a distal pancreatectomy with or without splenectomy, okay? So you can see here, again, we basically only know how to divide the pancreas in one spot. It's right over that, right over the, it's the neck of the pancreas, right over the SMV portal vein, right? So you ask me, what do you do if the tumor's right there? Well, you got to go to one side or the other. You got to choose to either get a little bit closer to the head and do a distal pancreatectomy or cut it a little bit closer to the tail and do a whipple. But here, again, we divide the pancreas right along the SMV, and then we take everything else out. So here's the kidney. The adrenal gland is right here. We take it down to the renal vein, the adrenal vein. Um, in this operative approach, if the tumors, this is for adenocarcinoma, so um, the operation here pretty much matches what we would do for a carcinoid or a neuroendocrine tumor. But here's an operative picture as well. So you can see here's the divided pancreas right here. Then here's the portal vein here. Here's the renal vein. This is the adrenal vein going up to the adrenal gland here. And this is Gerota's fashion. We would typically take the spleen with this. You have to divide the splenic artery and the splenic vein to get this out. So that by, by necessity then, the spleen loses its blood supply. There are splenic preserving techniques in which you can actually keep the short gastric vessels from the stomach to the spleen intact. That will sometimes keep the spleen alive. Um, but quite frankly, I don't really worry about this very much, except in patients like MEN patients who you're operating on when they're pretty young, potentially. Um, but there are ways to preserve the spleen. We just simply don't do it very often. This, you don't have to do any anastomoses in this operation, right? You just take the distal pancreas and spleen out. You do have this cut edge of the pancreas right here and the duct is sitting right there. That can leak and you can have a pancreatic fistula from that. Um, however, that usually will close over time. So we drain these and as long as it, that fluid is drained away, that uh, fistula will usually heal. Okay, so functional tumors, right? We said functional tumors, we pretty much always recommend resection. Um, and the reason is because they're functional, right? It's, it's kind of like adrenals in that, in that regard, right? An adrenal, nod, an adrenal adenoma that's functional, take it out, right? 
similar to pancreas. A pancreatic neuron tumor that's functional, you take it out, whether it's um, what, no matter what the size. And the kind of scary thing about one of those reasons is actually that, with the exception of insulinomas, most of these have a very high potential for malignancy on the order of 80 to 90 percent of developing lymph node and liver metastases. Insulinomas are the ones that have a very low risk of becoming malignant. That's why we can do an enucleation for insulinomas. Now, nucleation sounds great, um, and you're asking, why don't we do it more often? The problem is the pancreas gland, again, can be very soft. It can be very friable. It's not like the liver where there are sort of it's a big area and there are defined segments and you can kind of carve things out and preserve vital structures. The, the pancreas is small. There's not a lot of real estate there. It's hard to remove part of the pancreatic parenchyma without damaging that main pancreatic duct. So the nucleations can be kind of tricky. But again, we will do that for insulinomas, but for the rest of the sporadic functional tumors, we would recommend resection. So here's just a, a We'll talk about gastrinomas and insulinomas briefly. Those are the two most common functional tumors that we'll see. Um, essentially, if you have a suspicion of Zollinger-Ellison or, or hypergastrinemia, you check a, a fasting serum gastrin. They certainly need to be off of PPIs, but even if they're on a PPI and it's sky high, you pretty much have the diagnosis. This is in the setting of intractable ulcers, gastritis, and duodenitis. Um, you, can, you can check a gastric pH. Um, and then, and again, if you check their serum gastrin level and it's elevated um, or do a secretin stimulation test, um, you kind of confirm in this uh, algorithm, they're calling it ZES, Zollinger Elliston gastrinoma, right? Now you got to check for MEN1, okay? Because that does change how you manage these patients. If they don't have MEN1, you basically resect the tumor, okay? If it's a sporadic and no surgical or uh, medical contraindication, contraindications, you can resect them. If they have metastatic disease, you essentially manage them symptomatically. But we'll talk briefly about MEN patients. Localization is hard for gastrinomas, okay? They can be small, right? Um, and so CTS, EUS, Octria scan, that's old. I would say dotatate PET scan now. Um, you want to do all those things to try to figure out where this tumor might be. And again, they can be very small. There's something called the gastrinoma triangle which centers right here over the head of the pancreas and duodenum. And what you do is you sort of do a laparotomy, you do an intraoperative ultrasound, so you, get the, you have the probe yourself, you can put it right on the pancreas. Um, and then you do what we call a duodenotomy. You basically make a hole in the duodenum. I got it. We'll go, I have that in a, in a later slide. What you want to do is you open up the duodenum and you feel for these little nodules in the mucosa and submucosa of the duodenum. Those can be where gastronomas are. This is just an example of a tiny little gastrinoma sitting here. This is actually behind the duodenum. This is the duodenum being retracted over. So insulinoma, what do you do for an insulinoma? Um, you confirm it basically with a 72-hour fast. Um, and then once you confirm hyperinsulinism, um, you localize the disease, right? Um, here, this algorithm talks about unresectable liver metastases. That's unusual. Again, most insulinomas are um, uh, non-metastatic. But if you can see it, then you basically resect it. Um, if there are multiple lesions, again, that means they have MEN1. That's weird to have multiple lesions otherwise, right? And we'll talk about how to treat MEN1 patients. But if you have no visible lesion, you can get an EUS. Um, and then you can also do um, arterial sampling. Basically, what you do is you, try, you do arterial stimulation venous sampling. So you basically um, cannulate, like the GDA that's that... Uh, that perfuses the head of the pancreas, stimulate uh, insulin secretion, and then measure venous um, insulin levels. Then you do the same for the distal tail through the splenic artery. That will at least give you that, was it this side or that side? Do I have to do a whipple or a tail of pancreas? That gets to be pretty uncomfortable, you know, and, I, and we really hope we can localize it better than that. Um, so non-inherited um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are usually solitary. Again, if they have multiple uh, PNETs, um, you really start thinking about hereditary syndromes. Uh, VHL is a common one for them to have um, neuro, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. They're usually non-functioning in VHL. Uh, NF1 can have it in tuberous sclerosis. Most commonly, it's going to be MEN1. Recall that MEN1 is an auto, autosomal dominant um, MEN, uh, menin uh, DNA repair gene um, mutation. 
pituitary, in addition to pituitary tumors and parathyroid hyperplasia, somewhere on the order of 50 to 75 percent will have pancreatic or duodenal neuroendocrine tumors. These are potentially malignant, and so the insulinomas that you get with these are potentially malignant. And again, they can be tiny. This is the uh, body of the pancreas with a tiny little nodule right there that's turning out to be um, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. This is an example. So when you've made the decision to operate on somebody with MEN1, you have to understand why you're doing it. Is it for a functional tumor? You have to understand that you are basically debulking that tumor. You are not curing that patient. They will develop additional neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so this is where we try to preserve the spleen if we can. Um, we would try to enucleate pancreatic head tumors if we can. This is what I talked about, the duodenotomy. You open up the duodenum and stick your hand in there and take a feel around. You go behind the pancreas. This is part of that gastronoma triangle. You go behind the pancreas, clear out the lymph nodes behind here. This is often an area where gastronomas in particular can hide in MEN1 patients. This is sort of the workup or sort of the algorithm for MEN1 patients with hypergastronemia. If they have documented hypergastronemia, but no duodenal or nodal disease and no or very small pancreas tumors, you basically manage them medically. Okay, so if you can't localize or see a tumor, you try to manage them medically as best you can. That tumor will probably declare itself at some point, but until then, you really just try to hold off on surgery as long as you can. If they have duodenal or nodal imaging, but no pancreatic um, tumor, then you go in there, you go after the duodenum. You open up the duodenum, clear out the duodenum, clear out those lymph nodes, and then you check the pancreas to make sure they don't have anything in the pancreas. But if they have both duodenal or nodal imaging and they have a large pancreatic tumor, you need to go after that as well, and you want to take that pancreatic tumor out. So this is um, a very interesting patient of mine that I saw uh, almost four years ago now. She's a 15-year-old uh, girl who was having hypoglycemia, and they couldn't figure out why. Uh, of course, this reads like a board question, right? Her family history is unknown because she's adopted. Um, but they basically, eventually, they sort of figured out and confirmed that she did have fasting hypoglycemia, but they couldn't figure out why. And you would not expect a 15-year-old to have an insulinoma. That'd be very unusual, unless, of course, they had MEN1, right? So we, they eventually sort of figured out, and we got a CT scan, and this is that contrast-enhancing nodule that I was telling you about, right? This is where neuroendocrine tumors light up on a, on a contrast-enhancing CT scan. You see that bright light bulb right there? This is the axial view, this is the coronal view, and it's hanging off the uncinate. They do an EUS, and we have, it's positive for a neuroendocrine tumor. Remember, you can't tell if a tumor is functional or not based on the biopsy, right? A functional neuroendocrine tumor and a non-functional neuroendocrine tumor look exactly the same under a microscope, analogous to adrenal adenomas, right? So, once, once we kind of said, oh, she has an insulinoma, oh, yeah, her calcium levels are high. Oh, yeah, her PTH levels are high, right? And so she has presumed MEN1 at this point. Her gene testing was actually pending at this time, but nobody wanted to let her go home, and so we planned on taking her to the operating room to take this 2.5-centimeter um, insulinoma, presumed insulinoma out of the uncinate, which is that lower part of the pancreas. Um, and so this is what it looks like. This is her intraoperative ultrasound, um, two and a half centimeter. This thing is just hanging right off of here. This is the perfect um, size and location of a lesion to do an enucleation. You're away from the main pancreatic duct. So what you don't want to do with an enucleation is enucleate the tumor and put a hole in the main pancreatic duct. That will give you a pancreatic fistula every time. It will be really hard to close. <laughs> but there's a big mass of tissue in the head of the pancreas and the uncinate well away from the, from the pancreatic duct. And so our plan was to enucleate that. Well, of course, being a good surgical oncologist, I did an EUS of her entire pancreas while we were there in the operation. And, of course, I found a 4-millimeter nodule in the body of her pancreas. Right? So now what do you do? Because the problem is you don't know which one of these is the insulinoma, right? It could be this five millimeter thing. It could be the two and a half centimeter thing. So you actually have to take both of these out. And this is the splenic vein right behind here. This is the portal vein. Can't see it on this cut, but it looked like this tumor was away from the main pancreatic duct. So rather than do a distal pancreatectomy in a 15 year old, 
um, I elected to sort of enucleate this. And so this is what this looked like intraoperatively. Um, again, we have two lesions down here, one in the uncinate, one in the body. This is what this thing looks like. You know, again, very distinct, well circumcised, smooth, relatively easy to enucleate. Um, just to kind of orient you, the pancreas or the duodenum is reflected up. That's the inferior vena cava right there. Then this, you can kind of see where I've already kind of chewed into the paint. We've already enucleated that five millimeter little nodule. And so we were able to get that nodule out as well. And it was indeed just about five millimeters in size. She had a, she had a pancreatic fistula post-op. She had a drain in place for about a month, month and a half. That fistula did close. Um, Note that she so far has not developed any additional pancreatic lesions. She actually just underwent her three and a half gland parathyroidectomy. She does have a stable prolactinoma. So what do you do after you sect them? We actually have no adjuvant therapy that reduces the risk of this coming back, even in lymph node positive patients. So what I do for the lymph node positive patients versus the lymph node negative patients, I basically just watch them more closely. So um, a, a, a node negative patient, I might get scans every six to 12 months and be pretty quick to space that out to 12 months. Patients with lymph node metastases, I may start with, every, with scans every three to six months um, and be a little bit slower and sort of spacing those out. Importantly, though, again, the survival still is, um, is, is pretty good, okay? So um, survival probability here in this study, again, if they develop lymph node metastases, that does go down. Um, but if they have, um, this is overall survival, and on the right is disease-related survival, disease-specific survival. So what I tell patients is even if they develop metastatic disease, this becomes a disease that we manage chronically. It's something like high blood pressure that we never quite cure but we will sort of manage it long term. Again, if you have lymph nodes and the number of lymph nodes is prognostically important. Okay, I'll spend just a couple of minutes now talking about metastatic disease. The liver is the most common site of metastatic disease. The problem with neuroendocrine tumors is rarely is it unifocal. Rarely is there just like one lesion. It's often this sort of small miliary disease. So resection can get kind of tricky. There's something called liver-directed therapy that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about systemic therapy. So when you have sort of isolated liver metastases, the sort of meat-headed surgery way to think about it is everyone deserves at least one good debulking, okay? Um, and, and the reality is people benefit from it. And so if you can remove up to 70% of the tumor um, in the liver, a rough estimation, there does seem to be some improvement in those patients. So this was a 47-year-old a gentleman who actually had a, had a lymph node in his suprasternal notch that was enlarged, biopsy showed well, well differentiated grade one neuroendocrine tumor. Subsequent staging, he ended up with a terminal ileal primary, but he had liver metastases as well. So I, I'll use this case as an example, though it's not quite pancreatic. On the CT scan here, we see a couple, one, two, there's two or three more lower down in the liver. And so again, with this slow growing thing, good thing about slow growing cancers are they're slow growing cancers, right? The bad thing about slow growing cancers is chemotherapy and things like that don't work against them, right? So really, surgery is our best sort of treatment option. So we took them to the operating room, but of course, those two or three liver metastases seen on imaging was only the tip of the iceberg. We ended up finding like 20-something liver metastases, so we resected about 17 of these, and then we did an ablation, what we call microwave ablation of the deeper lesion. So something like this that's deeper in the liver, rather than cut all this liver out to get to it, we put a probe in it, that carries microwave energy, and we just ablate that tumor. Something like this that's close to the surface, we simply just kind of pluck them out like you're picking fruit out of a fruitcake kind of thing. Again, they're well circumscribed. And so far, he's doing well. He's recurrence-free four years after surgery. So when we have that sort of diffuse liver disease, though, and we can't operate on them, we have hepatic arterial therapy. And it comes in two flavors. Transarterial chemoembolization, or TACE, is delivered through femoral artery access. Um, you basically park a catheter up into the liver, and we have, um, you can, you give sort of this emulsified chemotherapy, and then you do a hard embolization with beads that literally you get to stasis where you cut off the arterial blood supply. Remember, they're contrast enhancing. They have a robust arterial blood supply. Alternatively, you can use drug-eluting beads, which are little tiny microscopic beads that are loaded with chemotherapy. The other thing you can do is do what we call Y90, transarterial radial embolization. These are much smaller beads. You actually don't get stasis. You don't actually get an ischemic effect. 
but the yttrium 90 are beta emitting. If you remember, beta emitting radiation is the one that like only goes like a millimeter or two. So you basically get a local uh, radiation effect without systemic radiation. Um, and then this was a study, basically we did a study with Ohio State where we compared radioembolization to chemoembolization. They were a chemoembolization institution, we were a radioembolization. So we kind of figured, well, let's just see how patients did. And we saw, you know, here in this series, about a third or a quarter had pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors with liver metastases. The radiographic response rate was pretty similar, 85% for radioembolization, 97% for chemoembolization. Again, with that hard ischemic embolization, you really get a good radiographic response. We saw no difference in overall survival between the two approaches, no, nor did we see a difference in progression-free survival. Now, understand those surgeries always preferred compared to taste. So we only use chemo or radioembolization or hepatic arterial therapy whenever we whenever we cannot operate on them, or for instance, we've already operated on them once, they've had their one good debulking, and they have diffuse multifocal recurrence. Liver transplant, so, so famously Steve Jobs had a liver transplant for metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. Um, it sort of works well. Um, it's an option in, low, in liver and liver only disease, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of not used very often, quite honestly. So systemic therapy for well-differentiated tumors, we have octreotide-based therapies and some cytotoxic chemotherapy agents. For really differentiated tumors, you basically treat them like small cell lung cancer. Um, so quickly, just a couple of the studies that are going over, land, um, going over the systemic treatment, and then we'll leave some time for questions. Um, this is a study which looked at uh, mid-gut carcinoids uh, or neuroendocrine tumors uh, treating with lanreotide versus a placebo, and we did see an improvement in progression-free survival. So lanreotide is sort of our backbone treatment for these patients. Again, we measure success in progression-free survival. This does not shrink tumors, okay? This gives us some disease control, disease stability. This is not gonna shrink tumors. Um, in the subgroup analysis, they, again, the, this study had 91 patients with pancreatic tumors, and it, and it looked like it had a similar effect. Um, this is uh, Everlemus. Um, this was actually in pancreas tumors only. So, um, so in Everlemus here, this is um, the waterfall plot of the change in response. So this is actually, we can shrink tumors with Everlemus here with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And we showed an improvement in tumor response with Everlemus versus placebo. Progression-free survival again was improved with Everlemus uh, compared to placebo. Unfortunately, we saw no difference in overall survival. And that's going to be a common theme to our treatments here. Uh, lastly, the most uh, recent thing is, uh, is uh, lutetium or lutetitium dotatate therapy. Basically, the same thing that we did a dotatate PET, right? Same similar concept, but we load it with radiation. We load instead of a you know PET active thing that lights up on a nuclear medicine scan. We load it with again a beta emitting radiation source so that we can get localized therapy to metastatic disease. So you give this systemically, it gets incorporated into the cell, and then the beta emission treats it with local radiotherapy. Um, this trial looked at mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, which included pancreatic tumors. Um, again, progression-free survival, and actually showed some overall survival benefit with the lute dota tape. So that's one of our um, sort of more uh, recent treatment options. So what do we do sort of in general? I think with liver dominant disease, we still favor debulking or resection, and then some form of chemoembolization or hepatic arterial therapy is um, our general approach. However, if they're extra hepatic dominant, you can get uh, bulky lymph node disease, you can get peritoneal disease, you can get carcinomatosis with these. Um, that's probably where debulking or resection plays a role, but that's where we call PRRT. So that's what Lute Dotate is, is called PRRT, peptide um, receptor radiotherapy. Okay. Again, this is all with a backbone of systemic lanreotide for sort of disease stabilization. So um, the takeaways from this would be that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are slow growing with a good prognosis. Understanding the, incident, the um, operative resection is the main treatment for local regional disease. Those less than two centimeters can be observed. Treatment for metastatic disease really still centers on surgery. I will say, I should say that that's really for the well-differentiated grade one tumors. So the poorly differentiated, again, we treat those basically like small cell lung cancers with a platinum-based chemotherapy. 
But again, treatment options for metastatic disease, mostly surgery, and then some combination of hormone, chemo, or targeted therapy, or radionucleotide therapy. Um, so with that, I'll thank you. And I was always told to end the talk with the thing that was most important to the audience. So there's the CME code. Uh, thank you. And so I'll stop sharing, right? Yeah. And then we'll check some chats, questions. There's the CME code. All right. <laughs> Any questions from the uh, virtual audience or the in-person audience? Uh, that was a great question. So we, uh, you know, in endocrinology, a lot of things, hyperhidrosis, and routinely end up being an evaluation. Mostly, I mean, wish it would be like glucagonoma kind of symptoms or the VIPOMA kind of symptoms, but flushing and sweating or hyperhidrosis. You know, the pi hydroxy is usually a part of it. Normally, don't do CGA because it can be mildly elevated. Let's stop doing that. And, um, uh, but anyway, so. Sometimes, I mean, what do you recommend that we sort of, even if the levels are normal, is there any false, like negatives should be still like, I see that there's so much more neuroendocrine or maybe we are finding right. more or right. is it something environmental? So. Well, it's so, I think it's probably more we're discovering the incidental tumor, just like adrenal yeah. adenomas, right? Everybody's getting a CT scan for something and we're, and we're picking these up. However, though, like I wouldn't be, um, uh, sort of reassured if you look back and say, oh, this patient had a CT scan and they didn't see anything, but they're really acting like somebody with like carcinoid syndrome. Because again, these can be actually hard to see without like an arterial phase liver scan. And so um, a lot of times people will have like renal protocol stone scans in the ER, but you will not necessarily expect to see these. And yeah. so I think when you have very high elevated chromogranin A, you know, again, if, you're, if, if you don't check it routinely, that's understandable. But I think when you get beyond that little hundred ish or whatever, you know, that might be attributable to PPIs, I don't think it's unreasonable to consider doing a scan or something like that. Yeah. I know we've some shared things, the monitoring. Yeah. 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 Based on the grade that yep. is observed, that and, and and it's hard. It's a lot of work, right? Like like honestly, surveillance is not the like easy way out. It's oh, the yeah, harder yeah. thing, right? Because yeah. I mean, patients just are very anxious and they get very nervous and they still, you know, are thinking they have pancreatic cancer, you know. Yeah. And you really have to work with them and understand that, yeah. um, that that you have to, you know, it, it's. It's going to be okay, but again, the operation is a big operation too. This That's is right. this is and not yeah, something that we can sort of sniff at. Yes, sir, Dr. Winters. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you, Mike. Likewise. From here, I am in Florida. First, just a point, and that is that the fellows should remember that uh, uh, taking uh, 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 gastric acid inhibitors. Uh, markedly increases the chromogranin A level so that you will get a false positive uh, test in all of the patients taking Nexium and all of these PPIs and all that. So you have to be sure that uh, you, you've withdrawn those drugs to avoid the false positive. The second was a point I didn't follow. So when you find the tumor, then you're going to do a biopsy to tell if it's adenocarcinoma or a neuroendocrine tumor. And then you said, you could not tell if it's functional or non-functional. So is there not enough tissue to do immunocytochemistry for all those potential uh, hormones that you were listed there or even PCR to see? Because in, in other types of endocrine tumors, we find that the tumors may express the gene or even stain for the protein, but it doesn't have to be demonstrable in the peripheral blood and not enough to cause a syndrome. And, I wonder whether you, you, if you don't look for it, you're going to lump together these non-functional but hormone-producing tumors together with the non-functional tumors, which are neuron, neuron. And then you might get misled about the natural history of all of them. Yeah, and I guess it's, it begs the question, if it's, if it's functional, 
if it's if if under immunohistochemistry it's overexpressing a hormone, but they they are not symptomatic. Does it matter? Are they functional, right? Um, and I think there's possibly a subclinical kind of component to it. So so yes, to clarify, yes, you can do specific immunohistochemistry staining to sort of identify overexpression of something like insulin. It's just not routinely done, um, and I want to sort of use that. I think the clinical phenotype of these patients, you know, that's kind of how I would categorize them as functional or not. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. One thing that fellows get, get on the board, I did my research, arterialization, calcium accumulation. Yeah. So, and uh, they get the numbers and then uh, you have to pick where it is. So you can you repeat those three the sperm essentially? Yeah. Kind of so think. think let's see. Um, yeah. yeah. So you got to kind of understand. So so the head of the pancreas is going to be um, supplied arterially by the typically the gastroduodenal artery. That's what they're typically cannulating, and that's what's going to provide the hepatic heart. That's what's going to give you the head of the pancreas. Okay. So that's going to be um, through the hepatic artery, or then hopefully they selectively cannulize the GDA, the gastroduodenal artery. That will localize to the head. Okay, the splenic artery is what would localize to the tail. Um, and the sperm is on the middle. So then that, yeah, so the, then that's the SMV yes, going right down the middle, which sort of divides the head and the tail. But that's the venous drainage, and that's not, that, they wouldn't necessarily, that's not what would be stimulated necessarily. It's just a G yeah, I mean, it gives you a, a left or right kind of thing. It doesn't tell you, like, it's right there, right, yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, I'll ask one more. So you said in one case, we, you showed us that there was a, both a, a tumor in the head and in the tail, and you didn't know which one was functional. So it, at one time, they would sort of walk a sampling catheter down the splenic vein and get multiple blood samples for the hormone of interest and look to see where the step up might be. Is that falling out of favor? It has. It has. And it's it's tedious. And then... So a high volume institution that might be treating 20 or 30 MEN patients a year, that might be something that they would have the capability to do so, but that would be a pretty unusual course at this point. And, and it kind of at that point, you're sort of there, you, you know she's symptomatic from, from something and, you know, resecting, the additional resection of one of those lesions didn't markedly um, attribute, you know, increase the risk of that operation. So if it, if it would have been the difference of like, a Whipple operation in a 15 year old, let's say, um, whether I was going to resect or leave that tumor, then that may very well have been something worthwhile doing. Thank you. Yeah, and there was a question. The calcium stimulation. Calcium. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. I, see. I mean, the function, the functional workup is is the physical exam, is history and physical, basically, right? I mean, that it's basically if they're symptomatic from it. Um, that's kind of how how you sort of determine functionality. But then everybody gets um, the five hydroxy and the chromogranin. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That was very. Oh, it's my privilege. Thank you all for having me. All right. I will end the call, I guess. Yes. All right.